Hey everybody, this is Eric Mueller, the host of The Eric Mueller Show. You're tuned into the podcast that explores what makes any successful person's inner clock tick by unlocking the most impactful tools within their success portfolio. I'm joined today by Emmanuel Daniel, a global thought leader in the future of finance and founder of The Asian Banker. Let's head on over to the interview. Emmanuel, welcome to the show. Eric, thanks for having me on. Uh, and great, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So let's just get right on to it. Let's get started, man. Yeah. And, but, but before we even dive deep into this entrepreneurial story and your expertise regarding personalization of finance and the geopolitical navigation as an entrepreneur, we want to know what makes up your success portfolio. So if you're new to this show, real quick background on it, think about it like an investment portfolio that has that compilation of your financial assets that make up your financial goals and push you towards that financial future you're chasing. Well, here on The Eric Mueller Show, I want to discover how successful people like Emmanuel invest in themselves and build that foundation for success. So Emmanuel, start us off here with this. What are some skills or traits, habits or mindsets that make up your success portfolio? You know, Eric, uh, what made me successful 20 years ago is, looks very different uh, from what makes people successful today. Uh, I started a business called uh, the Asian—I mean, the Asian Banker—and then which, which now is uh, you know a conglomerate of uh, different titles like wealth and society and so on. Um, I was a employee who made the transition to entrepreneur uh, in an at an age in 1996 when. Um, you know, startup capital was not floating around the way it does today. Uh, today, you you don't go out there and uh, represent yourself as an entrepreneur if you if you don't have the skill of um, you know going out for capital and and you know from from the word go. Um, in my time, you build your business organically. Uh, you know, the, you go through days when you can't pay your bills and hold your breath. Um, and then, and then you know, every cent you make, you save, put that together. So in those days, uh, wealth or assets would be your pension fund, um, you know, some of the savings you were putting together, uh, and your introduction to securities, uh, you know, and uh, and and that was it. You just needed to just spend enough time to to build on it. Uh, and today, uh, you know, you you add uh, fixed assets like um, you know properties, um, and then alternative assets like you know Bitcoin and and paintings, um, you know, which I which I like, uh, and you know, I've been I've been collecting um, collectibles is something that you you build on uh, when you go through the mid phase of your of your uh, entrepreneurial journey. You, you start taking an interest in things that are not related to the things that you're making money on, uh, you know, and, and you plug, use that to plug into things that you're interested in and stuff like that. Uh, you know, and then the rules just totally changed. Today, um, if you are a startup and you can get good funding and you're walking up the series league from series A to B to C, the wealth just create gets created as you go up the league. You know, it's got nothing to do with the solidity of your business, and and you need to be able to monetize and asset and and turn into assets uh, the money that is passing by you. So it's just a totally different mindset today uh, from the days when I was um, you know building my own wealth, uh, and I'm learning from what there is. So for example, right now. Uh, I'm uh, turning the business that I run into a platform for investments into similar businesses of this of the you know businesses that I understand um, you know publishing research consulting uh, that sort of thing and uh, and and it's my ability to attract um, other investors uh, that makes uh, defines my success today uh, in a way that didn't define my success uh, in the early days of my of my of my entrepreneurship journey. Uh, and I also must say that um, for those of us who come from families that don't have a history of entrepreneurship, uh, we got to learn all this stuff ourselves. The instinct, you either have the instinct and, and you make it up as you go, uh, or you learn it from scratch. So um, it's quite different from 
um, you know, a lot of young people today uh, whose parents worked in large corporations and uh, who who start off with, you know, with very comfortable levels of capital with which they can go out and build ideas. Um, they, their mindset is really very different. So, I mean, I'm just throwing out to you uh, my journey uh, and what I see uh, happening today uh, or rather the profile of an entrepreneur today. Yeah, and I think a, a, a further piece to this this question kind of tease out a little bit more from you here, Emmanuel, is what really is success to you? If someone asks you to define that word, what would you say it is now and how maybe has that changed throughout your life as you've you know gone through the entrepreneurship uh, piece and also done a lot of traveling? Yeah, I now do a lot of traveling because uh, the work itself uh, doesn't uh, turn me on. You know, uh, I'm I'm on a new journey now, and that's uh, that's why I'm able to go out there and, and see the rest of the world while the business itself uh, is humming along. And the best thing that an entrepreneur can do is to get out of the way uh, of the people who are, you know, the next generation who's coming in there, want to prove themselves, uh, you know, want to have the right to make decisions, uh, stuff like that. So, so I'm actually uh, at, at that phase in my own life in the life of the business that I run uh, and the people who work, work with me. Um, you know, uh, the age difference is such that they are mostly in their mid to mid thirties to early forties, uh, where they want to prove something that is in their league. Um, and, and a whole lot of things that I used to do that I become very tired of, over, um, uh, now I just allow them to take on and build on it. And I have to redefine myself. Uh, and that's how I ended up writing my first book last year. Um, you know, I put out my my personal ambition to go out and see all the 185 countries in the world. Uh, you know, I, and I've done about 115 so far. Uh, and as I do that, uh, I'm redefining myself. So, so that's where I am in in my own journey. Um, you know, and and I think that all of us uh, should uh, be giving ourselves each uh, you know new targets as we go along. Uh, if you're not doing that, something inside us is dying. Yeah, and you said 115 countries, so you're you're over halfway to being to every single country. That's that's ridiculous. That's really really impressive, Emmanuel. What did the uh, what what do you say that's uh, taught you over the years? You know, may, maybe as a person, as an entrepreneur, what what is the biggest takeaway that you've learned through all of that traveling and putting yourself out there? You know, Eric. Uh, the first 90 countries were work related, you know, like like I wasn't even thinking about going out and seeing the whole world. Uh, it's just that work took me from one country to the next. I would go out for a conference and then that adds up and all that. After 90, I looked at it and I said, you know what, I, I think I can do the rest. Uh, and then COVID struck, uh, by which time I had done 95, 96, something like that. And and then I said after COVID, um, and in fact, right in the midst of COVID, I said, you know what, I I cannot give myself an excuse not to do the rest of the countries in the world. Um, and one of the things that I found that I had to pull myself out of during COVID uh, was uh, the idea of becoming too comfortable uh, with an ecosystem that you're familiar with. It could be anywhere in the world. I mean, I am from Singapore, so I live in Singapore. I live in a beautiful apartment that looks out to the sea and the city skyline. You know, if you were Chicago, you just imagine what the Chicago skyline looks out from the lake. Uh, that's exactly the view I have. Uh, you know, and and there's no reason to to um, you know to to give up something that you have and and to go out there. So then I I went out to China, where I've been doing business since 2000. But I lived there properly for two years, two years and a bit, um, and uh, and and in that two years, because there was you know lockdown, you couldn't get into China. But once you're in China, you're free to travel within the country. Uh, I made it a point to go out and see every historical place uh, that I had not been in the previous twenty years, you know. And then I was getting the hang of it. And then uh, you know when I published my book, I was in the U.S. for seven months, and and I keep I've been going back to the U.S. all the time and all that. The thing that I think that first strikes you, uh, I call it the the cab driver scene. Um, you know, all of us who come from any local community have a story to tell about the local cab drivers. You know, they've got an attitude; they get upset over the smallest thing, uh, and you get upset over them with the small over the smallest thing. But when you look at your own lo little local cab driver from the perspective of 115 countries, you you realize 
how enduring it is, how uh, how little, how small it is, in, in, you know, in the context of many things. Uh, and, and then you start to appreciate him in context, uh, you know, and then uh, you start seeing things that are similar between cab drivers in, in, you know, many different countries. In fact, cab drivers are one of the first people that I sit in the front seat and I ask them lots of questions, uh, you know, and, and I learn as much as I can about, um, you know, the local community uh, and things that you never understand, uh, you know, if you're just reading about them and so on. So I also have a rule, which is that I don't consider myself as have having visited a country unless I've done a minimum of three days, uh, and I've I've done some of the major institutions, whether it's a it's a church or a, or a uh, museum uh, or something that's important in that country, you know, and and then work my way through that way. Uh, and sometimes I just stay two weeks. I'm not in a hurry to see all the countries in the world. Um, in in fact, I I think that it's important to. Uh, to spend time to to connect the dots, as it were, um, and in the process, you start seeing things that are common between countries that have nothing to do with each other. Uh, so, Rwanda in Africa, China, Indonesia in Southeast Asia have something in common, uh, and Ghana. Um, and you know, in Ghana, I I I was there a few years ago, and uh, the the political process was, is pretty stable, meaning that they've got peaceful transfer of power and, and so on. Uh, and, and the politicians sort of, you know, gripe at each other, but, uh, you know, they, they it's basically a peaceful country. And so is Rwanda today. Uh, and when I asked the people in these countries, uh, why is it that, you know, you've got such great stability today? And the answer that they give me is because we've seen the difference or rather because we've seen the alternative because we've seen the alternative. Um, and, and then when I go around to new countries and see the level of stability, I look at the period in which they've seen the alternative. So in China, for example, they've seen the Cultural Re Revolution. And, and because of the Cultural Revolution, uh, you know, they, they don't, they'll do anything not to go back there. Um, you know, and therefore the race towards prosperity, uh, wealth, uh, you know, personal liberties, and all that. Um, same, same thing in Indonesia. They they saw the alternative during the Asian financial crisis of 1997. Uh, you know, and uh, and today it's a trillion dollar economy, and uh, and they're not going back to where they uh, where they were coming from. Um, and so uh, when I see countries that are really successful today. Uh, I try to look back and see the inflection point at which they started. Um, another country that's very interesting right now is Bangladesh. Uh, you know, a, a previous Secretary of State in the U.S. Uh, called Bangladesh a basket case in, 19, in the 1970s. Um, you know, no hope in hell of becoming uh, a middle-income country. And today, it's got a GDP that per capita GDP that's higher than its neighbor, India. Um, you know, and, and that's because uh, through you know natural disasters, political upheavals, and so on, uh, they've built uh, incredible levels of grassroots support uh, that has you know added up over the years, uh, and it's become an a incredible story of a textile-driven economy. Uh, you know, and um, and and you know, it's a country that's uh, that's well on its way to uh, middle income. Uh, you know, if if they just keep at what they're doing right now. Um, so, so you see trends between countries that otherwise you think uh, have nothing to do with each other. Uh, you see inflection points uh, in, in trying to decide uh, where uh, you know which countries have a have a chance of uh, you know becoming successful. In fact, something that uh, that I'm very aware of um, coming from this part of Asia uh, is that if in the 1950s, that is at the end of World War II uh, and at the start of the ending of the colonial era, if you were to ask uh, which countries had the best chance of becoming successful countries, you would have named Sri Lanka, Burma, and the Philippines in 1950, right? And, and the reason was uh, these three countries uh, had Western influence, uh, had uh, institutions uh, well in place, the uh, judiciary, the the separation of powers, um, you know, the rule of law, and all of that. Uh, they spoke English. 
they had some of the best universities in the in 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 the world at at that time. Uh, you know, the University of Rangoon was uh, uh, where Rudyard Kipling uh, was at one point, and and so on. Um, and and yet, and and the Philippines GDP was uh, as high as Japan in the 1950s. Uh, you know, and then uh, within 30 years, it just turned totally the other way around, right? So I apply that uh, to how we think about geopolitics today uh, and the grandstanding between countries like the US and China and uh, and China, for example, claiming to be, or rather, uh, you know, trying to take the mantle of, uh, of metal of being uh, uh, the, the leading country of the world in the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, it is not a given. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and India, um, you know, uh, saying that uh, because of its size of its population, uh, it stands a chance of, uh, uh, you know, uh, regaining the wealth that it once used to have and stuff like that. Uh, it is not a given, uh, you know, and, and then you go back and, and examine the elements uh, that can cause the country to lose its way. Um, you know, the elements of, um, of um, you know, dictatorship, uh, lack of transparency. Um, uh, greed uh, and 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 stuff like that. So um, so when I read the headlines of in in geopolitics and the grandstanding between countries, um, I try to um, I, I try to decipher the the elements that make that headline. Um, so for example, um, uh, I spend a lot of time in China, and uh, uh, we now have entered the age of. Um, uh, the internet, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, um, you know, GPT, uh, the ability to process information. So what is the critical success factor of any country that is going to lead us into the future? The critical success factor is the ability to deal with information. Uh, and what, what does it take to deal with information uh, it, to its logical extreme? Uh, information both uh, empowers societies uh, as well as tears it apart. Uh, and if you ask me, uh, I'd, I'd say that everything that is going on in the U.S. right now uh, in the way that the information society uh, is creating silos of you know, different opinion polls uh, and, and, uh, and, and tensions uh, between people, uh, these are natural, uh, you know, um, natural um, effects of uh, being an open society, um, you know, in the information age, uh, whereas China takes the opposite approach of trying to curate information, um, you know, and uh, and then you, you ask yourself, uh, which of these two countries are likely to lead us into the future? Uh, and I'd, I'd go for the country which allows information to take us to its logical um, extreme, but that comes with a price. Uh, you know, and and while a country like the U.S. pays that price, uh, it then sets the, in stage the the motion that um, the the you know the new elements that we need um, you know to hold society together in a stable manner, uh, you know, and so that's those are the elements that goes into my thinking. And a country that that proscribes what you can think or what you can say cannot possibly uh, be a natural purveyor of. Uh, of in of the information age, you know, because it's editing itself all the time, uh, you know that, that kind of thing. So, um, so, so when I think about the grandstanding, and I'm I'm not saying this to criticize one or to, um, you know, to 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 give the um, the flag to another, uh, but you know, to say what what are the elements that we need to look at, um, you know, I do think a lot about. Uh, the debt situation in the U.S. Uh, and its capacity to uh, to generate the amount of debt it does, but as a percentage of GDP, actually the U.S. Um, in 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 relative numbers, uh, the U.S. is not as indebted as some of the other leading countries in the world. So it's still got a long way to go. Um, you know, so you go back to the basics of the economics, the the numbers. Uh, to give you a sense of uh, how it's holding on, holding together, not the newspaper headlines and uh, you know and and the tensions and uh, um, and and the issues that that uh, different countries uh, uh, you know face. Yeah, and I think the the thought that I have on this is that you know thinking about the places you've traveled and the and the geopolitical uh, landscape that exists in certain countries, 
how might that impact like entrepreneurial opportunities? Or if we have someone listening that knows they have a business that they operate in the US and they're thinking about expanding it or they're wondering about maybe starting something that could be a global business, what factors should they consider? How, how, how can these opportunities really be heavily impacted by the ge- geopolitical landscape of the countries you're operating in? You know, Eric, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, what I've seen is that when I go to, uh, you know, really poverty-stricken countries in, in Africa, like Burundi, for example, and I see that the guy who runs the only uh, satellite to satellite television network uh, is a Chinese guy, right? And and he didn't get there by the ro- Belt and Road policy or anything like that. He just got there because he was probably running from the law somewhere else. Uh, you know, he ended up in Burundi, and I met him actually, and and had a sh- quick word with him. Um, and 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 somehow he, uh, the Burundians needed somebody who would give them cheap access to you know global entertainment. Uh, you know, and and he built that business. And nobody's like on his case at the moment. Like you know, he's rich. Uh, he's got a full control over the capital city's uh, entire television network, uh, and uh, and he's happy. Um, you know, and and I go through many countries in Africa. I meet Chinese people who who have never, um, you know, who 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 you'd never think that they would go out to such difficult places uh, and set up a business. Um, and set up, um, you know, a, a, a provision shop or a or a department store, uh, and and what they're actually doing is benefiting from the fact that uh, all these made in China stuff can find its way to these small villages somewhere in Africa, and they figured out how figured out how to uh, maintain inventory, um, you know, make sure that they have good good cash flow, uh, and they have to think about security, and they also have to think about their children's education, uh, and, and they band together and stuff like that. You'd never find an American doing that, uh, you know, and going out there and, and, and looking for uh, economic opportunities and, and to create wealth. Um, and on the other extreme, you go to a place like Connecticut in, in the U.S., and you see uh, this entire uh, armies of uh, fund managers all huddled together and totally pleased with themselves. Uh, and, and uh, um, you know, the, the rest of the world is far away. It's, you know, America is the best place to live in and Connecticut is the best place in America to be in. Um, and you cannot take them one step out of their comfort zone. Um, you know, and yes, they make lots of money, uh, but uh, you know, they they basically uh, are birds of a feather that 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 huddle together. Uh, you know, and just to get them to New York for lunch uh, is a big deal. Like you got to, you know, you got to get them on the train and you got to meet them at their club and, and all of that. So uh, the the mental makeup uh, of entrepreneurs in uh, in in different settings uh, is dramatically different, and and we need to think about um, how they are motivated. Um, can you become incredibly rich in the U.S.? Yes, you can because uh, you know the U.S. aggregates the wealth of the rest of the world. Uh, and if you are a fund manager, uh, you know you 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 you'd have a piece of the action. You you just need to plug into the process uh, and and be part of the community. Um, you know, as a rule of thumb, uh, the more difficult the place is, uh, the more uh, opportunities there are to create wealth. And then you've got to you know sort of uh, measure that against, uh, you know, the risks that you got to put up with uh, and where you're coming from. Uh, you might come from a difficult country yourself uh, where the opportunities are not as, uh, as, um, as uh, you know, available as uh, for some other people. In fact, um, when, when, I meet, uh, when I meet a Chinese um, cleaning lady in New York uh, who comes from a small town in China, and I ask her, I said, uh, China is booming right now. Why aren't you working in Beijing or Shanghai? And and she says to me in Chinese that uh, whether I go to, uh, from where I come, the village that I come from, whether I go to Beijing or to New York is the same thing. You know, uh, I'm I'm up against the same forces and she doesn't speak English well, uh, but because she wanted to raise her daughter and give her the best chance of a good education, so she made that 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 uh, journey to, to the US. Um, so every single day, 
uh, there are people who are making decisions that are incredibly difficult for themselves uh, just because they are imagining something that they otherwise don't have. Um, you know, and, and you can say the same thing about um, you know, people who, who rough it out as uh, actors in, in New York or, or startup entrepreneurs in, in Silicon Valley, which is uh, they, they're there not because of uh, the present. They're there because of a certain dream that uh, they want to make available. Um, you know, so, so I'd say that uh, for most entrepreneurs, uh, um, the first thing you need to do is, of course, be totally in touch with what is best about ourselves. And then the second thing we need to do is, um, you know, which community gives us the best opportunity to realize the, the best potential of ourselves. And, and some of us who have not got good education, who have not got very good uh, communication skills, um, you know, very limited, even within the countries that we come from, uh, a country as difficult as something in, in Africa uh, might well be the best opportunity, and I see I see real people uh, living those dreams, uh, you know, outside of their comfort zone. Yeah, and you you mentioned wealth a fair amount in that in that last response manual, and I want to ask you, you know, kind of your your book, the Great Transition, the personalization of finances. Here, what does wealth mean in the future? What do you really mean by that that terminology, the personalization of finance? Could you define that for us? Oh, wow. <laughs> Eric, you're now taking me into technical ground, right? But let me make this as, uh, as layman as possible, as simple as possible. Uh, yes, the definition of wealth is in transition. Um, today, we think of um, a mortgage as being uh, an access to a, 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 an asset class uh, that will become ours uh, when we finish paying up the mortgage. Uh, and so we're willing to spend 30 years sitting on a mortgage uh, until it's paid off. And then uh, the house is yours, the valuation of the house goes up, uh, you, you know, and, and that's wealth. Um, imagine what wealth will look like uh, if a mortgage is some, and, and in order to get into that mortgage, by the way, uh, you've got to spend about three months uh, going through all the paperwork uh, you know, getting lawyers to check on the encumbrances around the, the property that you're looking at. Um, you, you don't want to get the property wrong, right? Now, imagine what wealth will look like if a mortgage is something that a Gen Z, or now I've heard that there is a new generation coming on to Gen A or Gen Alpha, uh, can, can complete uh, at the touch of, a, of, of their finger on, on a mobile device uh, in a second, uh, because uh, all mortgages or rather all properties are lodged digitally on a blockchain. Uh, all, uh, you know, uh, all encumbrances are visible to everybody, just like all the cabs in town are, are visible to anyone who's using a Uber, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, there's enough transactions taking place in a working day that you can enter and exit out of a transaction as you like. Uh, so it's not not uh, inconceivable that the idea of property as an asset will become incredibly e ephemeral. Um, in fact, even with the institutions that are in the mortgage business, they don't hold the mortgage on their balance sheet anymore. They originate the mortgage and then they hive it off to the capital markets, which is which then hives it off and turns it into a derivative, uh, and then into a derivative of a derivative. So there are. Uh, incredible number of financial institutions today uh, that are generating wealth, not uh, on the back of an actual asset, but on a derivative of an asset, you know. So now that kind of access uh, to the information on a mortgage is now becoming available to ordinary people. Um, so I'm saying that uh, how the next two generations are going to gen uh, define as wealth uh, is becoming incredibly ephemeral. Uh, and it's also uh, related to their lifestyle. Um, you know, I, I love my cars that I had before. And today, uh, because I travel so much, I don't drive anymore. And I'm very happy uh, getting onto a luxury car, uh, which is available on the local uh, Uber network, um, and and as long as it's consistent, uh, high quality, uh, and and uh, and good service, uh, I'm happy. I'm so happy. Um, you know, driving is no longer, you know, it, 
my own mindset has changed so dramatically that from when I was a student where I would want to show off that I had a good car to where I am today where I don't care uh, what, what I'm driving or how I'm getting to a place, uh, it's been a dramatic shift for me. Uh, in fact, I would never drive a uh, the uh, gas car anymore. I, I, my my next car would definitely be a electric car, and and better still if it is a you know a self drive, uh, you know or or a autonomous vehicle. So which can go out there and and operate on its own while while instead of sitting in a garage. Um, I, I'm I'm well into that um, you know into that kind of culture uh, as it's being built right now. So uh, so the personalization of finance uh, is. Uh, that that transition that society is making uh, into an age where uh, wealth becomes uh, something that is uh, transient, uh, lifestyle driven, uh, and and you know uh, it, it's amorphous. It's not uh, it's not solid uh, stuff that you can own and 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 claim uh, prestige with. Um, you know, so um, I mean that in a nutshell, I think is a layman way of describing. Uh, the personalization of finance. Um, you know, at the same time, um, the institutions themselves are changing. Uh, what they're selling to you uh, is changing. So I tell the banks that nobody in the world wants a mortgage. Uh, you know, they want a house, but a mortgage is a way of getting there. And and uh, in the future, uh, with cryptocurrencies, with the ability to uh, buy and sell uh, assets uh, or anything, a token of value, in a network setting, uh, is going to need banks to start changing what they think uh, they they provide as a service or a product to their customers. So I say to the banks that if your products don't change, nothing changed. Uh, you know, and and I keep saying that to them uh, when they're trying to define what innovation uh, should look like going going forward. Yeah, that and you mentioned uh, you know you mentioned the blockchain, and that kind of got me thinking. You know, kind of really like the non-fungible aspect of an asset, like, you know, we've all heard of NFTs within the last few years and, and the boom with, with that in terms of just the popularity of people knowing about it. The question I have, the, the last question I'll ask you about this is, do you think that us as the United States will ever have like our own central bank digital currency? Like, like the dollar currently right now is physical. You have to hold it. You, you can see it on, on your bank account, but at the end of the day, something physical is, is changing hands. Do you think we'll ever get there in a digital sense, or, or is that something that, that may still not happen? So I'm the only guy in the whole world who's saying now that uh, CBDCs, or central bank digital currencies, are designed to fail. Uh, and they're designed to fail for a number of technical reasons that's got nothing to do with personal liberties, because I've, I've spoken with uh, some of the central bank governors of the countries that have already introduced CBDCs. Uh, the take-up is not as strong as it can be and so on. But what CBDCs are up against uh, is the technology that's driving cryptocurrencies and stable coins. Uh, and when you put them alongside each other, this is what you're looking at. Take any cryptocurrency, you take Ethereum, you take Solana, you take Tezos. Each one of them has got in the magnitude of hundreds of thousands of programmers building applications around them. Um, and, and the applications are developed every single day. In other words, the, the platforms are being transformed uh, you know, by the sheer energy uh, you know, of, the, of the user base that's global. Uh, and open source computing, APIs, uh, those are the drivers that are transforming uh, the way in which money will look like uh, going in the future. But if Janet Yellen, um, you know, waves this white paper that she puts out saying that, you know, the U.S. should also have uh, uh, digital currency and so on, just because every other major country in the world is talking about it, um, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate into reality. The reality is that uh, there is a competition taking place uh, between all the major uh, forms of money. Uh, even the fact that today your bank account, because of Fed now, is totally digital, uh, you start looking at your deposit account very differently from someone 30 years ago. You know, 30 years ago, a deposit account is something where you saved 
you know, very uh, cautiously, uh, and there's compounded interest that gives you wealth, um, you know, over a long period of time. But today, because of the digital nature of a deposit account, uh, most depositors have a util utilitarian view or a util utilitarian idea of what the deposit means. In other words, where can I use it? What can I use it for? Especially in the digital space and especially with the new stuff that's coming on with the metaverse and so on. Uh, and the kind of token that's going to succeed in, uh, in the new digital realm that we are creating today and the network economy uh, you know, requires tokens that uh, uh, have a very strong utility element to it. Uh, and I think that the CBDCs are just not going to uh, be able to keep up with the competition to get there. Now, there's a governance issue, which is, uh, would you trust a central bank that issues a currency which they can control uh, and they can manage uh, you know, the entire citizen, citizenry uh, in terms of its usage of, 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 the, uh, you know, of the token? Or uh, would you like to see... Uh, Every bank in the country competing with each other, issuing their own stable coins. Uh, and that, to me, is a more likely outcome uh, as we see this, uh, this race uh, to tokenize the economy uh, and to create uh, a digital token that is usable as a currency. Now, the beauty of crypto uh, is not that Bitcoin went up to sixty five thousand and all that, and and you know, and not at all, you know, like uh, will it also go up to a hundred thousand, a million dollars, and so on? The beauty of crypto is that each of us can create our own crypto. You can, I can, um, the person next to us can. It's just seven steps. You can go into the, you know, you can go on Google and then you can create your own crypto. The question is, will the next guy accept my crypto in lieu of work? Uh, in view of value that I want to be able to, um, you know, generate. Um, and we've seen that those, you know, like Sam Bankman-Fried, um, issues his own crypto. He, he even states his own price and everybody believed him. And then we saw what happened. Uh, and that, that kind of story is going to repeat again and again and again until we form a culture uh, in, on, on building the checks and balances um, around how we define what a token should be uh, and how we, uh, you know, how we pay each other uh, and recognize uh, value in each other. You know, in my book, um, the, the, the Great Transition, the, the, the Personalization of Finance is here. Uh, there's a small section where I discuss how uh, the energy of the sun finds its way uh, to a utility on the planet Earth, which is, um, you know, the sun uh, hits the planet, uh, the chlorophyll turns it into energy. Uh, the the animals eat the plants, uh, and we eat the animals, uh, and that's how energy transposes, uh, you know, from the sun to where we are. Uh, and that's a form of carrying a token uh, of value uh, through uh, in nature. Uh, and the beauty of the of the of of carrying token of value in nature is that there are no intermediaries in the process, whereas in human society, in everything that we do, there is an intermediary. Even in something called decentralized finance today, there is an intermediary, uh, and every player in decentralized finance wants to be the ultimate uh, intermediary, just like central banks want to be the ultimate intermediary in central bank digital currencies. But I think that um, with uh, what technology is making possible, uh, the whole idea of crypto is, is that it's permissionless, uh, it's fundamentally permissionless. Um, we're getting there uh, to a realm where uh, the intermediaries need to redefine uh, the role that they need to play. Uh, so that in a nutshell uh, is what the personalization of finance is and what we can look forward to uh, you know, with central bank digital currencies and the future of money. Yeah, that's all very interesting. And obviously, we'll, we'll see where we end up. I, I mean, it's very exciting to think of what it could be. And Emmanuel Daniel, really can't thank you enough for, for spending the time to be on the podcast today to talk about, you know, the geopolitical landscape for entrepreneurs and talking about the future of wealth and, and the personalization of finance. So really grateful to you for that. If someone's listening and wants to reach out to you and learn more, what is the best way to contact you? Oh, Eric, uh, EmmanuelDaniel.com. That's my blog page. Uh, actually, I've made it into 
like the meeting point of everything else that I do. So if you get there, you'll get to see the book. You'll see some of the points I just discussed, uh, and um, you know, and and the ideas that I'm I'm uh, working on, uh, especially for my next book that's coming on, which is more about civilization than it is about finance. Sounds perfect. Yeah, we'll tag all that in the show notes. Drive a lot of traffic to your website, and Emmanuel Daniel. Once again, thank you for being on the Eric Mueller Show. We'll look forward to keeping up with you in the future. Thanks, Eric.